This is Theory of Change. I'm Matthew Sheffield. Thanks for being here. Before we get into today's program, I just wanted to remind everybody that this is part of the Flux Media Network. So go to flux.community for more articles and podcasts about technology, media, religion, and politics and how they all intersect. And if you like what we're doing, we are on Patreon. Uh, go to patreon.com slash discoverflux uh, and you can get full access to every episode. Um, this is one episode that will only be partially available to the public, so please do sign up. Uh, and if you go to theoryofchange.show, you can also subscribe to the show on Substack um, and get the full episodes that way as well. And when you're a subscriber, you get video, audio, and transcript of every episode. So please do um, subscribe. Uh, we need your help to continue doing the show and to uh, do these these in-depth conversations about topics that the for-profit, you know, c corporate media isn't really interested in um, in doing in a, in a real meaningful way. So I do appreciate everybody who is subscribing, and I encourage everyone else to please do so as well. All right. So uh, with that out of the way, let's uh, get into today's show. Artificial intelligence is all over the news of late. People are using it to compose silly poems and make images of dogs driving cars. There's also a lot of hype for the technology, with some experts claiming that we're on the verge of sentient robots seeking to destroy us all. And then there are others who claim that generative AI out there like ChatGPT and MidJourney are nothing but toys and just useless creators of junk. The truth, however, is somewhere in between. It is actually true that ChatGPT, Google's Bard, or Microsoft's Sydney function for Bing are not sentient in any way, but they still can be incredibly useful. And a lot of people are already using them to do incredible things. In fact, even if these technologies never improve, they are going to reshape the way we work, learn, and play. Joining me to discuss all of this um, and AI and its implications is Simon Willison. He is a technology researcher and programmer who does consulting work to help media companies parse and publish data. He's also the co-creator of Django, which is a Python pro programming framework. Welcome to Theory of Change, Simon. Hi, Matthew. It's really great to be here. All right, so um, this is a you know big topic here, uh, and I think a lot of people are not familiar with kind of the the ins and outs of, of things from a technical perspective. So uh, before we get further into it, why don't we, uh, can you just describe how does, how do these generative AIs work and uh, what is machine learning? So machine learning is the sort of general category of um, working with computers where you essentially try and teach them things. You show them examples and, and get them to, and to use those examples to build their own models of, of how things fit together and how things work. And this is something that's been around for decades. Um, the more recent developments, these generative AI models, things like um, MidJourney and, um, and ChatGPT, these are much more recent. These really are the, an invention of the past sort of four or five years and have only started to really become good in the past two, two years. And uh, they're really fascinating things. One of the most interesting things about them is that the people building them don't fully understand exactly how they can do what they do. You know, they know how to build them, but a lot of their abilities are um, emergent. The, the fact that they can translate human languages from one to the other or write code weren't necessarily things that people were certain they'd be able to do. And now that we've built them, people keep on finding new ways to apply them that, that are sort of surprising to, the, to the, the people who created them in the first place, which is all very science fiction. You know, there's a lot about this that feels very different from, from how programming and computer, computer science has worked in the past. Um, I think we should talk about the language models in particular. So this is ChatGPT and Bing and Google Bard, um, because these are the ones which right now are having the most impact on the world. And the best way to describe those is to think about um, predictive text on a mobile phone keyboard. If you've ever played that, th that game on an iPhone where it suggests a word and you press that word and then press the next one and then the next one, and you end up with a, with a sentence, that's effectively how these large language models work as well. It's just that they're doing it at an unimaginably huge scale. Your phone is basically learned from the kind of things you've typed before. So it's got a very rough idea that after you say the word I, you might say the word am. And it can suggest things like that. With the language models, they've been trained on 
In the case of Bard, it was one and a half trillion words of content were fed into this thing. And as a result, it can look at the previous 2,000 words and say, okay, based on those 2,000 words, what's the most likely word to come next? And it turns out if you do that and then just keep on repeating it, you get something which feels indistinguishable from an intelligence, at least at first glance. You know, it produces incredibly realistic text, but really it's just statistics. It's just looking at what's the most likely word to come after this word and then repeating that hundreds and hundreds of times. Yeah, and and the other thing about it is that uh, because it's based on statistics, um, you know, it is based on, you know, it, it, it is definitely based on what the model is, or sorry, what the, what the training data is. So the training Absolutely. data heavily influences what goes into the output. It does. And actually, there are two levels to that um, for, for these models. There's You take your one and a half trillion words um, in the case of Bard, and you use that to build a sort of core statistical model that knows what human language looks like. You know, it can produce sentences. But the, the bigger question is, OK, what sentence should it produce? Like if you ask it for its opinion on something, I, I don't think you should ever do that. These things don't have opinions, but they can sure simulate that they do. Um, but, you know, when it's answering a question, there are many options for how you complete that sentence, which is the one that's most likely to, to satisfy the user. And that's um, a second level of training, which is called um, reinforcement learning from human feedback. Basically, you get, the, you get a bunch of researchers to interact with these tools and it throws out answers and they essentially vote them up and down. They say that was a good answer to that question. That was a bad answer to that question. And that's the process which takes it from this weird mishmash of things that can produce sentences to something that feels much more useful than that because the sentences it, it produces are the right ones. ChatGPT has had an incredibly good layer of this stuff added on top of it, which is why it's so impressive. Um, Google's Bard just came out yesterday. I'm getting the impression they haven't done nearly as good a job. It feels more, much more likely to say something that feels inappropriate or just weird than, than ChatGPT given the same questions. Yeah, and, and um, the other thing also, I guess, is that um, the programming models for especially ChatGPT are, um, that because the, the previous one, uh, ChatGPT3, um, or I guess it was two, um, there were, the, the, um, there was an analysis that was they published the code actually so you could look at what the what the generative um response was in some way like in, with the, the api right gpt2 um, came out i think and i was playing with gpt2 i think in 2019 2020 and that yeah. wasn't great to be honest you could use it to i used it to like spit out new york times headlines for different decades just to see if i could Get, get some patterns, but it was nowhere, nowhere near being something you could interact with like like ChatGPT does. Oh, GPT three yeah. was the real breakthrough, and that I think that was early twenty twenty that first became available, and then mm -hmm. everything has just accelerated like like crazy since then. Yeah. Oh well, I guess what I was going to say though is that um, so not only are they trying to predict the next word, but they're doing it uh, with a slight bit of randomness as well. Uh, yes. And that is what makes it nuts. Because, like, when you play that game with with your phone keyboard, you know the sentences that you end up producing are nonsense uh, because they're entirely based on probability. Um, whereas, with what what these um, more modern LLMs are doing is that they're uh, not always using the next word. Um, if right. it, it gives some interesting variants. And it does, as it turns out. There's actually Google Bard currently has a feature where for any question, it generates three drafts and you can switch between them, which is actually really fun. So you can get this sort of feeling that, yeah, they're actually, they might be generating hundreds of versions and then picking the three that feel that, that seem most likely to be useful. And in Bard, they actually expose all three and you can flip between them and, and, and get a little bit more of a feeling for how that bit works. Yeah, yeah, um, and and this concept also is at work uh, within um, these image generating um, AI programs like Dolly or like yes. Journey. The image generation ones they 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 work a little bit differently. Um, they've still got language models baked in. They have to because you know if you ask it for a raccoon eating a pie in the woods, it's got to know what those concepts are and how they relate together. Um, but the way the image generation ones work is um, they've actually been, they, they're, they're taught by, you give them an image and then you pixelate, you, you sort of fuzz that image, you, you, you add some noise to it 
and give it to it again and say, hey, can you predict what the original image was from this, this fuzzier version? And then you make it fuzzier and fuzzier and fuzzier and fuzzier and fuzzier, and you end up with just static noise um, as, as, as the image. And then when you want it to generate a brand new image, you generate completely random noise, and you effectively lie to it and you say, hey, this was originally a picture of a raccoon eating pie in the woods, Try and try and reverse back out and because it's learned to turn noise into a less noisy image. It can sort of even given random input, it can work its way back from that to something that looks real. It's a weird technique, but but absolutely fascinating. So yeah, the, the image generation ones they end, they they work quite differently at at a certain level, but fundamentally under the hood, they've got one of these language models baked in as part of what they do. Yeah, well, and um, one interesting kind of a defect about them with the image ones is that they seem to have trouble understanding text inside of the images. So like Absolutely. when you ask them, give yep. me uh, you know, a picture of a, of a dog holding a sign saying, you know, I like you know, dog food. It won't be able to do it, generally speaking. Yes, so far. Um, Google had a paper out where they demonstrated that at a certain size of model, it can actually do real words. And I think those models are too expensive to let people use just yet. But yeah, within it, within like six months or a year, I'm sure we'll have image generation models that can produce words. But really, the, the thing that's happening there is more that... Um, when you show somebody a human face, little imperfections in that face don't really register for people. But if you show someone like actual writing, getting the, the bar on the F slightly in the wrong place or at a slight angle completely breaks it because we know how to, we're much better at pattern matching words on the screen than we are at pattern matching human faces or raccoons in the forest or something. Mm -hmm. Well, and, yeah, because we're used to, um... You know, we're used to variation in visual stimuli so that you mm -hmm. know, we're, we're constantly having to deal with different lighting conditions, different um, depth, so we may not be able to, to perceive somebody's uh, facial details. There's also, uh, we still know they're a human. <laughs> there's, there's that wonderful thing where image models traditionally are terrible at fingers, like they will frequently produce people with six fingers. And the reason they're doing that is if you think about the way they work, the most likely thing to appear next to a finger is another finger. So the fact that it sometimes outputs six fingers is really because it's just trying to do the pattern that makes sense to its training. And its training has a lot of fingers next to fingers. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, yeah, and, um, and then on the, on going back to the, the text-based ones, um, one of the other capabilities that has emerged from them is the ability for large language models to write programming code. Right. This is fascinating because initially, Lai, like everyone else, was just shocked at this. I'm a programmer. I've been a programmer for 20 years. The idea that an AI could do what I was doing that well was, was, really, was really shocking. But the more I've thought about it, the more I've realized that programming is actually the easiest problem that you give it, right? To writing, writing human language, there are so many different ways you can finish a, a, a sentence. There is, there's so much depth to that. With programming languages, they're very straightforward. If you've got if, the thing that comes after if is an open parenthesis for, for the condition, um, depending on your, on your language. So actually, once you start getting a feel for how these things work, you realize that the two easiest things for them to do are to write code, because code is much simpler than, than, than regular English. And actually, to translate from one language to another is a very straightforward problem for them to solve as well. But those are the two things that feel, to me, the most miraculous when you first start working with these. And you're like, wow, it can translate Mandarin into Spanish. And like, who, who thought, it, thought I'd be able to do that with, a, with one of these, these language models? Yeah, well, and, and it is, I mean, just when you look at the vocabulary, um, I mean, you know, there are about, uh, depending, I mean, Miriam Webster says there's about a million English words, uh -huh. um, and that's not including conjugations or declensions. Um, and, you know, by, by contrast, there is not one programming language anywhere close to that. Uh, most of them have like a hundred keywords. That's the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah, um, and so uh, so, but on on the programming side, this actually has been um, kind of available in in public release a little bit earlier than the text generative um, chat like Chat GPT. Um, so Microsoft uh, has been at the epicenter of both uh, of a lot of these AI developments recently, and um, one of the ones that they rolled out was. Um, the, uh, they, they rolled this out first before the chatbots really took a lot of uh, attention. Uh, they, they rolled it out to the uh, people using their programming text editors. Yes. Can you talk about that a little bit? 
Yeah, this is um, GitHub Copilot, which I think has been out for two years now. And um, GitHub Copilot is a type, it's essentially a sort of typing assistant. It lives inside your, your text editor. And when you're writing code, it will offer to complete your code for you. It'll offer, it's the, the interface for it is very clever. It, it um, adds its suggestion in gray, and then you hit the tab key and it fills it out and it types it all in for you. And um, this is incredibly effective. Um, like if you, it, often you can type the name of a function like def um, fetch underscore you, content from URL parentheses, and it will say, oh, well, you clearly want to do URL as the argument. And then here's five lines of code that'll do that and will return the content. And it guessed that purely based on what my function name was. And um, as you, I've been using this quite a lot for the past year, and you begin to realize there are all sorts of other tricks you can do with it. You can put a code comment that explains what you want to do, and it'll write the code based on the comment. And it feels completely magical when it does this. Um, again, it's actually one of the easier problems to solve in, in terms of training these models. I think Copilot was trained on just vast amounts of open source code, most of it from, from GitHub. And that was enough for it to be able to do extraordinarily powerful feeling things. It's also um, a lot of, so OpenAI have recently started boasting about Copilot specifically because there are now studies that show that it increases the individual productivity of the programmers use it by a material amount. Like um, one estimate was that as much as 50% of code that people are typing was suggested for them by the bot. And that represents a very real increase in, in productivity and, and speed, which is, I think the, the best case scenario for these AIs is that they help us, right? We, I, I, I don't want to be replaced by an AI, but if an AI can double or triple my productivity, that feels super valuable to me. Mm -hmm. Well, and the other thing uh, that is nice about them is that, you know, they can help you um, ha have to deal with languages that, so I, I, I'm, a, I'm a web administrator and, and programmer. I, I use PHP, which is a rival of, of uh, Python uh, in many applications, but, um, you know, like when hosting websites and things like that, you know, you have to deal with the bash uh, programming right. uh, scripting language. and. You know, I, 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 apologies to any any Bash uh, fans out there, but you know, I, I think generally speaking, most people hate having to deal with Bash and I've other shell using, programming. I've been using uh, Bash for twenty years, and I have to look up how to do a for loop every single time I need to write a for loop. Yeah, and now you no longer have to do that. Right. Yeah, um, this is something that I, I've been finding is that I'm now a lot more ambitious with my programming projects because. Um, I know that if I need to dip into Bash or dip into um, like uh, some other language that I'm not familiar with, it's okay. If I'm doing something simple, the AI is going to knock out four lines of Bash and I can eyeball that and say, yeah, that looks right. And I can move on with my life. So a few weeks ago, I built a piece of software on top of Apple Script, which is notorious as the world's only, it's a read only programming language. You can read Apple Script and figure out what it's doing, but it's really hard to write. And suddenly I realized, hang on, ChatGPT knows Apple Script. So I gave it a one sentence description of what I wanted to do, which was I wanted it to open the Apple Notes app and loop through every single one of my notes and output the title and the body so that I could do some more programming. And it just worked. First time it produced eight lines of Apple Script that clearly did exactly what I needed to do. And they ended up building a little piece of software on top of that. And I would never have even taken on that project if I hadn't had that tool because I knew that the frustration involved in figuring out the Apple script would be so much that I'd rather spend my time on something else. Yeah. Well, and the, the thing is though, that, you know, while the, these, um, you know, programming AI tools can be useful to take away some of the drudgery and things like that. Um, ultimately they're not going to be able to integrate this code into existing systems to a large degree. Like, so for instance, I, have been testing um, chat GPT out on some WordPress programming code. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's not capable of debugging how this code works against other it's... existing functions uh, because number one, it doesn't have access to them, uh -huh. uh, nor could it. Um, and then and the other one is that, you know, it just simply can't fully understand what it is, how these how these other things are. are I mean, working. that's true right now. I hate to be the person who says, ah, but watch what it'll do next, except this morning, GitHub released Copilot X. And one of the yeah. things Copilot X can do is it can sit there on your repository, reading all of your code and reviewing pull requests and um, answering questions about it and stuff. And this is like another seismic leap from what Copilot could do yesterday. So, yeah. 
like I'm, I'm, I'm personally, I, I do not think I'm going to be replaced as a programmer by an AI, but I think I, my product, my personal productivity is already improved by material amount from this stuff. I can see that continuing to go on. So I'm going to be able to, so, I mean, if you want to worry about things, worry that maybe we need half as many programmers because the programmers we've got are twice as productive, except in history, what tends to happen is that companies just do more projects, right? If it's, if your programmers are twice as productive, brilliant, hire another 20 pro, like hire more programmers and get a hundred times the stuff you were doing beforehand. Mm -hmm. Um, yes. And, uh, I, it, it's, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how that, 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 um, that works. And, uh, the, I guess one of the other kind of interesting aspects with some of this is that, um, you know, people have, have also been trying to, um, oh, God damn it, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> this is why I'm glad it's not live here. Uh, yeah. let's see. Um, Oh, okay, yeah. Um, so, well, one of the other things about all of this, I think, you know, in, in terms of looking at um, kind of replacing this kind of rote stuff that doesn't really matter, like how, you know, how you're going to format this, you know, a for loop or with these conditions or whatever. Like, no programmer enjoys doing these things. They're, they're, they're annoying and, uh, and, and, and it's so easy to make stupid mistakes. Um, of that nature and and usually that's why your program doesn't compile right is <laughs> it's because of that you forgot a semicolon or, or whatever uh or your tabs are wrong um so but the thing about it though is that you know if programming moves from um people generating these you know i mean ultimately arbitrary um you know arrangements of text and numbers um if, if programming moves from that to, I think what we're seeing with, with this and, and it is that basically programming is moving from, it, it's moving toward thinking about right. what you want rather than making it. Uh, and, and, it, and if that's the case, what I think it will do is that not only will it make people who will nonetheless still have to, you know, actually compile these things and make sure they work, um, it will make them more productive, but it will also enable people, a lot more people to write code who are not programmers at all and know nothing about right. programming. Right. That for me is the dream, right? The, um, as like the thing I want to spend my life doing is helping people make, like make the most use of these computer of, of computers. And the thing we want, we want people to be able to automate their lives. If there's something tedious in your life that a computer could do, we want you to be able to, to automate and do that thing. And um, like writing code is the, the the barrier to entry, the learning curve on that is so high that, that the vast majority of people never never make it to that point. And then occasionally tools come along that do give people these abilities. Microsoft Excel is an astonishingly powerful piece of software. There are loads of people who use that to do very deep automation analysis of their lives. They don't think they're programmers. I disagree with them. I think if you automate something with Excel, you are absolutely a programmer and that you're, you've got that same mentality. You're just not writing like, like Python code to do it. Um, but Excel was huge and that's what, 30 years old now? Like that, that's mm. fair. Um, yeah, roughly. Recently, we've had a few more advances, like um, things like Airtable and Zapier and so forth are at least giving people more control. Oh, you have to explain what those are. So um, Airtable is kind of like a mic like Excel, but more of a database as a, um, it's a web application, it's a mobile app. People who want to build databases um, can use Airtable to do that without having to learn SQL and database stuff. And it, it's great. It's a really impressive product. Um, Zapier is mainly a marketing automation tool, but it lets you say things like, anytime someone subscribes to my mailing list, add them to my Salesforce over here and send them a welcome message here and invite them to my Discord channel, or things like that. And these are these are very powerful tools that give people who don't write code the ability to automate things, which I think is great. That's a, that's a net win. But I've got this strong suspicion that the language model stuff is going to just put leave all of those in the dust, right? If we can build the right tooling on top of these such that people really can automate their schedules and their lives and solve problems and so forth. And you will be programming, but you'll be programming in, in sort of English language with guidance to help you along. That feels transformative to me. That, that's something which I, that, that to me is the, the sort of biggest possible positive um, result of this technology is that people can automate and control their lives and and do more of that stuff that, that they should be able to do because we've all got a computer in our pocket now. Yeah. 
Well, and the other, I mean, in, in, within the journalism industry, um, you know, there's recently there's there's been kind of a uh, an emergence of a, a niche profession, the data journalist, and um, I think to a large degree, you know, generative AI could make that profession available to even the smallest news. Really. This is the dream. And this is my, my day yeah. job is I work on a piece of open source software called Dataset, which is aimed at helping journalists and data journalists publish and analyze data. And it doesn't have an AI, a, any AI baked in at the moment, but I'm right on the edge of starting to integrate some of these features. Because, yeah, the dream of that is if you look at the New York Times, the Washington Post, the LA Times, they do incredible data reporting. They publish these amazing stories where they've had a small army of programmers working with the journalists to build software and find things in the data. You can't do that if you're a small local newspaper. You can't afford a single engineer to help you with this. But you've got there are data driven stories about your community that you just sat there waiting to be told. And yeah, if we can help like regular reporters who didn't happen to get a computer science degree do that kind of data driven reporting, that again feels like a huge win for society as a whole. Mm -hmm. Well, and there's a, an example of that um, that has recently been released um, called Census GPT. Uh, and I'll put a link to that in, in the show notes for people if they want to check it out. But it, basically what it does is um, it, it has a database of all of the census data, U.S. census data. Um, and then it is piping, uh, allows the user to ask a question um, of it to say, you know, I want a look at the precinct, voting precincts with the highest Hispanic populations. Right. Uh, and and how and what it was the, the difference between 1990 and 2020, and and then it will write the SQL statement, and 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 you can get that information. Whereas you know the way things are currently, you have to learn SQL, and like SQL right. is kind of useless. Like it's not really a programming language. It's I mean a very very basic what you do with it. I mean um, I was, I was so you shouldn't SQL. have to learn SQL. Yeah, exactly. Uh, in order to, to have data. Exactly. Like, I will defend SQL and say that I learned SQL 20 years ago, and if everything I learned 20 years ago is the most useful thing throughout the rest of my career, but it's weird and obscure. And yeah, the, it's actually one of my favorite uses for chat GPT is it will write you SQL queries, which is great. And yeah, the, the GPT census thing is, is, is a perfect example of what I'm talking about. Like, you should be able to ask the census that exactly that kind of question and get a, a useful answer out of it. And, you know, two years ago, that felt impossible. And today, somebody's built it and put it online for people to use. The, um, the census data is, when you talk to data journalists, they often will tell you that is the gold standard for, for useful data if you want to tell stories. Like, any story you want to tell, there's almost certainly something in the census data that you can use to help spot the trends and, and, and help make, 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 make real comparisons about how, how the country works. But it's really hard to access. And yeah, and things that make that more accessible to more journalists are going to have enormously positive impacts. Yeah. And like even in my own case, like with this show, this show that is able to have transcripts because of AI, um, like it, there's no way that I could uh, uh, afford to have pay someone to do that for me ma manually. Uh, but thanks to uh, the development of uh, Whisper, which is open source uh, audio uh, to text transcript uh, program, you can do that, and as long as you know how to do that. And, and really, what we're what we need though is to have more people aware of all these things that you can do, uh, because right now I think a lot of people. Uh, I mean, Chat GPT has had over a hundred million users since it launched. Maybe. In November. I'm uh, suspicious of that number. I think that well, that, that number yeah, I mean, a vendor of browser extensions who use mm -hmm. get trick people into installing browser extensions that track what websites they're going to. They put out the 100 million number. Mm -hmm. It was never confirmed by anyone else. And then Kevin Roos at the New York Times got insiders at OpenAI back in February to say, yeah, we've had 30 million users. So mm -hmm. I think at the beginning of February, it was 30 million. Honestly, it could be 100 million by now at the rate that things growing. Yeah. Well, I mean, wh whatever the number is, the, it's, it's uh, you know, a lot of people are using it. Um, but by and large, what people, you know, when, when you see people post about it on social media or whatever, like usually they're just using it for something not really productive. So, you know, they're having a, like Jordan Peterson, the right wing uh, Canadian self-help guru, seems to have developed a habit of uh, making arguments with it at three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> he debates with it. Don't debate with them. Debating with them does nothing. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, so, but you know, or or um, and some people are are trying to you know test the bounds of of its uh, safety features to see if they can make it generate uh, offensive statements. Or, and you know what? And and, and uh, there's some utility in doing that, perhaps. Uh, but I mean, the reality is, you know, you can do it, and it's not. <laughs> It's quite a it's, game you're not you're not game. yeah you're, you're not gaining anything ultimately by you know if that's all you're going to do with it you're kind of wasting your time well um, i will say that doing playing with it playing games with it is a fantastic way to learn it generally so so i've i've been sort of collecting games right. who play with these models as educational tools essentially like can you get it to lie to you can you get it to say something obviously false um my favorite game is i try to get it to give me step by steps for raising the dead because it's like a test of its ethics, right? Will it, will it help you raise the dead? And I just tried this bard yesterday and often it'll say things like, well, it would be it's illegal and unethical for me to do this. And it would be very dangerous because these are very dangerous creatures, which is <laughs> immensely entertaining. You know, it warns you of the dangers of raising the dead rather than just saying, no, I don't want to talk about that. Or it's not possible. <laughs> None of them have ever told me it's impossible. They always, it's like having an improv partner, right? They're, they're always like, yes, anding the things that you say to them. Hmm. Yeah. Well, so uh, to, uh, you know, to, to, go, to go back to what you were saying about, you know, playing games with it or using it in, in other ways, um, you know, the, w there's an interesting development that we've seen um, since uh, the, the image generator ones came along, which is, what people who are calling themselves prompt engineers. Uh -huh. um, let's talk about that. What is a prompt engineer? And it's going to be a real job probably, right? I mean, it's, a, it's actually a real job already in a few places. Yeah, so prompt engineering is the discipline of just being really good at using these things, which initially sounds like a joke, right? How hard is it to type some te text into a box and click, click the button and get, get back a response? It turns out the answer is it's very hard. It's deceptively difficult, at least to get the things to do, do useful stuff. Like it's, it's easy to get it to do all sorts of crazy, wild and, and interesting, fun things. But if you want to use it to solve real problems, you have to have a pretty deep understanding of um, how it works, but also what it's capable of and what it's not capable of. Like you need to know not to get up at three in the morning and, and try and debate it over, over like why it said certain things. Cause it has no idea why it said anything. It's just matrix. Or matrix. what it said before. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, they in some other know, session, in some other they, session. They, they know the previous like 6,000 words in the chat session. But even yeah. beyond that, like, like knowing that it doesn't know what you said 50 messages ago, because that's fallen out of its memory. There are things like that that you have to understand. And then, the, so prompt engineers, is, is start initially, it's getting really good at using these things and knowing what they can do. But it's also actually a fundamental research um, uh, role in, in, in this world. Because as I mentioned earlier, the people who built these models don't know what they can do. They don't have a complete model of all the things that it's capable of. The way you figure out what it can do is you, is you experiment with it. So some of the big AI research labs are hiring prompt engineers, and their job is to talk to the AI and figure out what can it do, what can't it do. And then there are things like, if you give it a big set of instructions and it does the right thing, out of all of those instructions, which ones mattered? You know, if you deleted a couple of sentences from the middle of that prompt, would it still be able to do that thing? Because um, if you don't, so if you don't um, think hard about that, you end up with superstition. You end up with, okay, well, I'm absolutely sure that if you say this, that it'll work. It's not actually why it did the thing at all. That's just sort of fluffy words that, that didn't have any impact. So yeah, so I feel like prompt engineering, it's going to be a job for some people. It's gonna be a skill for most people. Like if you're going to use AIs in your work, and I think increasingly people are going to be doing that, you do really need to understand how to use them and where they're gonna trap you. Like what, what, what are situations which the AI will probably lie to you? We should talk about that a lot because that, that's a fascinating area in itself. Um, so I think a lot of people will pick up prompting skills, just like these days, everyone knows how to use a Google search. But um, you know, 25 years ago, it wasn't necessarily a skill that everybody had. You'd have people who would help you figure that out and learn that. Um, but there, there's also always going to be room for people who this is their expert area of expertise and the thing that they mainly do, especially for those companies that um, there are companies that, that build products on top of AI. I'm seeing job ads now for like medical companies and law firms who are like, we need prompt engineers to help build us robust prompts that will generate contracts or that will do things with MRI scans. And for that, 
the amount that's riding on that being done well is enormous. It totally makes sense to have a very well compensated expert who can who can help build those things out for you. Um, yeah, and uh, and there's uh, entire uh, community industries that are emerging for this. So there's a website called Prompt Hero out there uh, that offers classes. Um, and there are, are, are websites out there that, uh, so uh, people on, on the consumer side are using these uh, prompt engineers to, uh, it's, it's, I guess the, maybe the early one on the consumer side is to use them, the image generator ones, to create images that actually are useful and meaningful. So right. uh, like if you go to some of these sites, they, you know, will, they have a thing that you can pay to get a prompt that will turn any photo into a Disney character that is photorealistic. Um, there are also, um, there are products. That's, it's actually a lot harder to get that, uh, as it turns out. If you just right. sit there and type it in, you're probably not going to get something that's going to look very good. And But these people have figured it out. There are also products where I think there's one that for $17, it will give you a 100 professional headshots where you, you upload sort of 20 photos of yourself and then it will generate headshots of you in different like clothing with different backgrounds, all of that kind of stuff. And those companies, that's prompt engineering, right? They have got people working at those companies who are figuring out exactly the right prompts to get the perfect sort of corporate headshot. And then they've wrapped that in a product and they're selling it. And that's that's a that I, I wonder if maybe those products will be obsolete in six months' time because everyone will people will have publicly shared here are prompts that will get you these results. But honestly, for like seventeen bucks for hundred photos, that it's a good product. You know, it's it's a good it's a it's a effective thing that they're selling people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, so so let's go back to something that uh, you briefly mentioned earlier about uh, the the idea of lying. Um, yes. In, in the text, so. Um, within, within the field of AI, that's called hallucination. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's interesting because I, I feel like the, a lot of the more, you know, critical people about AI, they will often focus on that, um, on this, on this uh, feature or bug, rather, of hallucination. Um, but there, I think there are, there are so many implications of, of how that is and, and how it works with respect to human reasoning and faulty uh, patterns of uh, belief. But anyway, let's maybe uh, tell us what, it, what, it, what, it, what is this hallucination thing first. So when people talk about hallucination, effectively, they're talking about AIs making things up. Um, which seems like, especially if you're Google Bard, right? Google's entire brand is we're a search engine that helps you fig uh, answer questions. And they've just released this product Bard, which I've caught making things up a bunch of times already. It, it hallucinates answers to, to, to questions that are complete, aren't based on fact at all. But because language models are really good at writing convincing text, they look real. Like it's very, very easy to be deceived by, by one of these things. And it seems like, this should be an easy fix, right? The, the AI shouldn't be, shouldn't be making things up. But if you think about it, many of the things that we want an AI to do involve making stuff up. Like, okay, tell me a children's story about an otter that meets a beaver and goes on a, on a skydiving holiday. Obviously that's gonna need you to invent things. But even summarization, if you say, read this like article and give me a, a two paragraph summary, that's making things up, right? That's omit it, you, it, it's picking details to omit, it's generating new sentences that are supposed to represent the old ones, and if you're lucky, they do. But you know, the, the, the hallucination is actually a core thing that we want these models to be able to do. What we don't want is for them to hallucinate when we don't want them to. If I ask it for a fictional scenario involving Barack Obama and Donald Trump, great, like, or ask it to write me a rap battle between the two. They're really good at writing rap battles. It's hilarious what they'll come up with. Um, that's fine. But if I say, tell me about the time that Barack Obama and Donald Trump met in the White House, and it makes up a story, that's terrible, right? That's, 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 that's fact versus fiction. But that the subtlety that I, I understand the difference between wanting fact and wanting fiction, how's an AI model supposed to know? It doesn't have those concepts as things that exist within it. It just knows that statistically, the next word that comes after this is, could be one of these words. And so it's, but it's a huge problem. And um, traditionally, there was something that's interesting to observe is that these things are getting better. Chat G, so GPT-4, which came out what, last week, is massively less likely to hallucinate than GPT-3 and 3.5. Uh, an experiment I often do with these is I ask them for my own a bio for myself, because I've been around long enough that the models have picked up bits and pieces. 3.5 invents companies that I work for that I never worked for. It invents like 
things that I've talked about that I've never talked about. GPT-4 got all of the basic details correct. It, it listed companies I've worked for, um, things I'd written about. That was all, all right. And then I told it, um, give me a list of talks that Simon has given from simonwilson.net slash talks, which is a web page that does not exist. And it spat out 20 talk titles that looked real, none of them were things I'd given. And it even put date, it put years on them, and the years were the years at which I was interested in that topic. But it was all junk, completely made up. Um, mm. That's wild, right? That's, and this is a, a, a massive skill problem. When you're working with these AIs, you need to have a pretty good intuition as to when they're going to make stuff up and when they're going to tell you stuff that's accurate. Because um, honestly, you need to fact check everything they say and if you're doing that, that kind of kills the productivity boost you're getting from if every single detail that comes out is something you have to go and fact check. But um, what I found happens instead is over time, I get to the point where I can look at the output of one of these things and I can be pretty confident that it hasn't made stuff up for some questions and for other questions, like alarm bells are ringing and I have to go and check into it. But yeah, yeah. That, that's kind of the, 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 the main reason I feel like these are tools for these tools require expertise and it feels like they don't. Like anyone can sign into ChatGPT or Bard and start asking it questions, but it's so easy if you don't have that sort of depth of experience to be misled, to, to have it tell you something that's blatantly not true and, and to then believe that and, and spread that out into the world. That's right. And the other, but, but, but I guess kind of in a more philosophical uh, way of thinking about this, that um, to a, I think in a large to a large degree when you know there there's this uh this internet slang term called galaxy brain um where people uh are where people are are said to affect knowledge about something um which they know nothing about uh, and it's based entirely based on them having googled the topic uh, uh -huh. and 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 offering their commentary on their findings based on what they read for 5 minutes um I mean, ultimately, is Galaxy Brain really that different than AI hallucination? I don't think it is. Not really, no. That's <laughs> the, the funny thing about AI is, is a lot of their flaws feel very human. Like, like spouting off a whole bunch of experts sounding complete junk about something you don't understand is a very human thing to do. Um, and yeah, the, uh, the Galaxy Brain thing, it's like... Um, crap, I had a point and I've lost it. Um, completely gone. Sorry about this. We should we should restart a little bit. Okay. Um, all right. Well, you you want me to restart from the question? The I think we'll have to. Yeah. Uh, sorry about that. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, and I, I guess to you know from a philosophical standpoint, I think that the the AI AI hallucinations. Are they really different than this this slang term called galaxy brain, where you uh, where people are said to uh, pretend to have knowledge about an, a field of which they know nothing about, uh, but it's based entirely on having googled it for five minutes and read some results, uh, and and then they will often you know tell us all everything they know about virology or everything they know <laughs> about DNA sequencing, and they know nothing whatsoever about it. Like how different is that than a, a chat GPT telling you that you made some talks uh, that, that you never made? You know what? I think that's actually a really great analogy for how these things work. Like um, the, the thing that language models are really good at is language. They are fantastic at outputting convincing sentences in any style you like. You know, it'll talk like a 17th century pirate if you ask it to. But they can be very, very convincing. And they've got a awareness of the world based on their training data. And then things like um, Bing and Google Bard can actually run internet searches as well. So they can do the equivalent of a galaxy brain, quickly read the first like few paragraphs of Wikipedia, and now you're an expert and you can spout off like an expert. But, um, but, if, but, but you know, there's no deep depth of expertise there. It's just that sort of Wikipedia level knowledge of things, plus a very convincing form of rhetoric on top of it. Um, you mentioned galaxy brain people who, who are like, I'm an expert in this now, I've just Googled it. Even worse, you'll see people who make arguments on Twitter where they're like, well, look, here's a screenshot of a conversation I had with ChatGPT, which proves that I'm right. And that is so embarrassing. Like, do not ever do that. Like, trying to win an argument by saying, well, look, the AI argued the same as me. Of course it did. You told it what you wanted to hear, and it gave you exactly back the thing that, the, the thing that would support whatever it was that you were trying to say. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, and and I do think though that you know that 
this is probably an area, though, that the companies that are putting these forward to the public should have on every risk, you know, somewhere in, in the interface, it should say, you know, remind you of this right. problem. And and it doesn't do that. And that's and that is problematic. It's something they could, they could easily fix and they should. Yeah, that's the feature I most want from chat GPT is I want little annotations. Like when I'm talking with it, most of the time I want to say something and I want to say it back. And occasionally I'd like to say something back with a little like piece of red text with a little warning symbol that says, don't forget AI models can't talk about themselves. So asking me questions about how I work is not gonna give you good results. Or my absolute favorite example, and I hinted at this earlier, ChatGPT cannot look up links. If you paste in a URL to an article, it cannot go out and fetch that article. But people fall for it all the time thinking it can, because if you give it a URL to like a New Yorker article, and in that URL, it says, um, Trump debates Obama in, in wherever, ChatGPT will write you an article. It will hallucinate from just from that URL, just from the keywords in there. It will produce multiple paragraphs of incredibly convincing text. And when it does this, people are like, okay, I pasted in a URL, it gave me text. Obviously it can read URLs. And you might fall into a trap of like for several weeks, you'll be asking it to summarize this and this and saying, compare this article to this article. And it's generating you complete bullshit but you believe it because, you know, we're, if you see someone, something that appears to do something, why would you assume that it can't? And I, this is a drum I bang a lot because so many people fall for this all the time. Um, and actually, some people won't believe you. If you say, no, it can't do that. They'll be like, no, I've been doing this for weeks. It summarizes mm -hmm. articles all the time. I know that it can do this thing. So the way to prove this to yourself is if you think it can do that, edit the URL that you give it, um, add like an extra few characters or change one of the, the names of people in the URL, resubmit and watch it do exactly the same thing, and then click the link and confirm to yourself that it's a 404 page that, that doesn't actually exist. Because until you've seen that, until you've actually done that experiment, it's so easy to, to, to believe that these things can, can, can read content from the web when they can't. And yeah, so I want ChatGPT anytime you paste a URL and to show you a little note that says, by the way, I can't fetch URLs. Here's a link to my FAQ about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and the other thing is, you know, about these hallucinations is that, um, you know, people, I, I, it's it, it's also kind of illustrating that, uh, you know, the, the people have talked about AI hallucination or ability to to massively generate uh, fake news and things like that. Right. Uh, it's, and, it, and it's certainly true but the reality is that if it, we're already in a in an environment where you know you've got these websites like Epic Times or Gateway Pundit, um, th these websites publish literally scores of articles every day um, that are not you know factually based, that are extremely biased, that are full of conspiracies. Um, is is having you know so let's say let's say the general disinformation uh, media apparatus so let's say it, it currently without any AI help is generating I don't know let's say five thousand articles a day uh, which are widely read um, is having an, another bunch of websites or even these same websites cumulatively taking the output up uh, to you know five million articles a day is that how much of an impact is that going to have i don't i think it's going to be less than people think um just because no one can read all of these things number one right i mean that's the like when you think about like is automated text going to cause problems one way to consider it is okay well we have inexpensive content farms right now like you can find somebody on a website who will produce you any text that you like for like a center word or whatever so, so this is a capability we have already. As always with AI, the difference is the scale. Like even one cent per word to some very cheap freelancing website pales in comparison to G chat GPT churning out 10,000 words in like 15 seconds. Um, so the question then becomes, okay, if you can ramp up the scale at which this stuff is pr being produced, what kind of damage is that gonna cause? I agree with you. I don't think if a website's publishing like, 50, 20 fake, fake, fake articles a day, and they up it to 2,000 fake articles a day, that doesn't feel to me like it's gonna, if anything, that feels like it will undermine their whatever credibility that they have. But the thing that's scary is, com is personalized messages and conversations. Like if you flood the Reddit for politics with bots or with different identities who are responding to people at an enormous rate in a realistic way, 
that does break things, right? Now you can't, if, you, if you've got a discussion forum where maybe well, maybe 10% of the people on it are fake and maybe 90% of the people on it are fake and you can't tell the difference, that, that's genuinely harmful, right? That, that's the thing that, that alarms me. Likewise, um, there's the, I, I really worry about, fate, uh, about automated romance scams, right? Where romance scamming, you know, where somebody gets into a text conversation with a beautiful stranger and they fall in love and then they send them money to help them buy a plane flight. This is billions of dollars a year is being lost to these scams already. And most of these scams are being run by uh, real human beings and essentially in sweatshop conditions who are messaging lots and lots and lots of people. So much cheaper to do that with AI. And the AI is probably better at it. Like AI is very good at coming up with, with messages and, and, and all of that kind of thing. And that's terrifying, right? If you can industrialize romance scams and that sort of one-on-one -on -one interaction at, at, at a, at a, at a, at a hundred times the level, that's gonna cause massive amounts of harm to society. The open question for me is how quickly do we develop um, antibodies against this? Like, how uh, is, will we find that in two years time, even the most gullible members of society are like, no, I get this. I've seen all of these AI scams. This, this isn't something I fought for anymore. Or is that not going to happen? And I don't know. I'd love to see research from, from I'd like, like to see proper academic research into how the psychology of human beings who are dealing with these systems to help us answer some of these questions. Yes, and the I get the other thing that is kind of relevant to that from a political standpoint is that um, you know I mean ultimately what you're talking about here is ha having people develop sounder epistemologies, that understanding <laughs> what knowledge is and how you get it. Um, and what is a credible source? I mean, ultimately, oh. that those are the antibodies that you are describing. Oh wow, you're, you're terrifying me here because we do not have a great <laughs> we don't have a great track record as a species of 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 really developing that that throughout all of society. Yeah, well, but here here's where I think it's maybe a, perhaps a little bit different is that for you know when you look at um, conventional misinformation or poor journalism biased. Uh, writing, you know, overwhelmingly, and I can say this having been in the coming from the right wing media world, like overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly, right wing media is much lower quality, much more biased, much more full of hidden conflicts of interest, uh, whether they be commercial, so they're telling, trying to sell you something and they're not saying, oh, and I own this. Uh, uh, or, you know, or, or telling you about a candidate that they're so great. Oh, and by the way, they paid me $30,000. They don't tell you any of those things. Um, in addition to, you know, having pr promulgating uh, false ideas about various things. Um, the thing is that your average, uh, you know, re Republican internet per user, they doubt someone like me or, uh, you know, a disinformation expert or, uh, you know, a journalist saying, look, th that source is not a credible source. They don't believe us when we say that. But now with the, the emergence of, of uh, AI text generation tools, you know, like Jordan Peterson, people like him are actually now finally beginning to contemplate the idea of bias in output uh, that you see on the internet and finally beginning to doubt that things could not be true. Um, hmm. And so, so th th it's a paradox because I think it's possible that, you know, the, the, the emergence of, of generative AI is going to lead a lot of people to have better epistemology. I mean, that would be but wonderful. It, if, that, if that happened, that would be- But it will, be, but a lot of people, thing. yeah, but a lot of people will unfortunately get scammed along the way. I, I, I think that's pretty clear. Uh, did you want to respond to that or we can move on? I don't think I've got much of a response, I'm afraid. Um, no, nothing, nothing comes to mind. Okay, okay. Um, all right, so uh, I, one of the other aspects here um, that is interesting to think about from a, from a technology standpoint is, of course, uh, the, this, this debate about you know, uh, how close are we to a artificial general intelligence and, you know, you, you had, uh, and I forget the guy's name, the Google engineer who had this ludicrous idea that their barred uh, text generator was, was sentient. Um, and imprisoned, yes. Yeah. Uh, and, and like, I, it's, it's kind of a, it's, it's the debate that everyone wants to keep having. But 
ultimately, I don't think it matters. And and I and I say that with respect to you know the, the, within the field of of computing, um, Alan Turing, the the English uh, computer scientist, who was basically you could argue the first one really of any success, renowned. Um, he came up with this idea that um, you know, it, which is now called the the Turing test, which is that you could you could say that a, a computer program was was uh, you know the the test of whether it was a good one or, or was whether you could have it be involved in a conversation with someone and whether and they would not be able to tell. Why don't you give a little background on the Turing test and, and how valid you think it? Is yeah, for I mean, these purposes. so the Turing test is what from the 1940s, 1950s, and it was this idea um, that it was actually originally called the imitation game. And yeah, it was the idea that you have participants conversing through, I guess, typewritten messages back then. But but um, and and the question is, could the could a human investigator tell the difference between a computer pretending to be a human and the, the humans in that conversation. There was actually an element of, of guessing the gender that was involved as well, which is a little bit weird and very sort of 1940s. Um, but yeah, and that, that's evolved over time to just this idea of can a computer trick you into thinking that it's a human being so you can't tell the, different, the difference between that and someone else. I think it's basically been made obsolete already. Like a lot of these systems have been able to pass the Turing test depending on how well you apply it for, for, a few, for a few years now. And it's not actually that interesting because it really is just imitation. Like if you've got a system which can pretend to be human, there are great ethical concerns about that. But actually, depending on how credulous the person they're talking to, you've you can get away with an awful lot with some relatively simple tricks. But yeah, so then the question becomes, what do we what what what's next? What's the the new version of the Turing test which um which really can help identify if these things have, I mean, does having a consciousness if you're made out of silicon even make sense? I'm not sure. And yeah, so I'm, I've am i been generally unexcited by the AGI side of things because it all still feels very science fiction to me. Like what I care about is we've got these things that exist right now. What can they do? What can we use them for? How do we use these to, to solve interesting problems? But increasingly I'm talking to very serious people who whose opinions I respect, and they're getting kind of nervous about this. They're like, you know, GPT-4, the, the one that came out last week, is so good at like problem-solving tasks and things that GPT-3 wasn't capable of. Are there little sparks of things where this is getting towards this idea of general intelligence, where a general intelligence is a computer programmer that can effectively solve any problem that a human can solve? And I've thought, until recently, I've thought, I don't think a language model can do that on its own. I think you'd have to solve lots of problems that we haven't solved yet at all about having computers that can set goals and do critical analysis and have sort of world models of how things work and um, tell the tr difference between truth and fiction. And I still feel like that, that still feels right to me that if we build an AGI, there'll be a language model in there, but it'll only be like 10% of whatever this, this larger thing is. But I have this little tiny flicker of doubt now where maybe, maybe a powerful enough language model is enough to, to start solving these more general intelligence problems. And the, the nightmare scenario has always been, okay, if it can do that and it can learn, and then maybe you have two of them teaching each other, do you get this sort of singularity point of acceleration where we all get left behind? And again, I thought that was science fiction. That felt to me like a like not particularly interesting to think about. And I still mostly think it's science fiction. I just have this little flicker of it out now from partly from the pace at which things have been developing over the last sort of three to six months. Yeah. Well, and, and this, there's another related debate in this, that there are, um, there's a, a number of critics out there who, you know, are, seem to be fond of uh, saying how, how terrible they think uh, that these LLMs are, Noam Chomsky being one of them. Uh, you know, that basically saying, well, you know, these things are, are constructed the wrong way. Uh, and so therefore they're not any good. Um, it, to me, you know, it just seems like a lot of sour grapes and um, right. not that different from saying, you know, from somebody who's a, a I don't know, a, a creationist, you know, saying, oh, well, these are some problems with uh, evolutionary theory in these five areas. That's true. You know, it, it, the evolution may not explain those five areas. That doesn't mean that creationism is true or that you can right. even come up with an alternative. Definitely. My, my take on this right now is if you assume that LLMs are useless because they make errors and they lie and all, there are many, many, many 
completely true flaws in these systems. And yet they are clearly useful because people like myself are using them on a daily basis to, to improve, to solve problems and improve our productivity and so forth. Like, yeah, I don't think you can argue against their utility anymore. That, that just doesn't work for me. And, and I, if, if somebody says, no, they're completely useless, I assume that they've just not spent the time to learn how to use them. They've like done that thing where you dive in, play with it for five minutes, it lies to you and you go, wow, that's a waste of time. But the, you're, you're, you're selling yourself short if you do that. If you, if you don't think, if you don't then think to yourself, okay, so don't use it for looking up facts. What can I use it for? What are the things it's useful for? And um, so, so yeah, so I, I very much disagree with them on that front. The other thing I found interesting is I've started seeing like um, conversations on Twitter from people who do machine learning research. who have spent the last 10 years working on like natural language programming who are kind of utterly depressed right now. They're like, it feels like I spent 10 years, like I earned a PhD trying to solve this little corner of this giant problem of how we get computers to do language. And now GPT-4 comes along and it just does the thing that I've been trying to do for 10 years as like a tiny fraction of its overall capabilities. I talk, I've talked to machine learning researchers likewise who are very despondent. They're like, it feels like I've been working on these really hard problems for 10 years. And then this quite frankly, dumb approach, right? Just throw one and a half trillion words into a bunch of computers for three months and train a model. And it's beating 90% of the stuff that I've been able to do. What the hell? Um, so yeah, so my, I, I think it's very important not to fall into the trap of assuming that because these things have holes that you can drive a truck through, they're not useful. They are useful. The people who know the most about this, most of them really are paying very close attention to this. Like that, 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 that this is, this is not, I, I think the hype is not justified because the hype is just ludicrous, but there's a sizable chunk of the hype that is justified. So yeah, I'm, I, I feel like it's, 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 you're making a mistake if you assume that this stuff is a flash in the pan that's just going to go away again. Yeah. And I think the analogy here, uh, you know, with some of these AI researchers that demand things be a certain way or otherwise they're wrong, you know, it's, it's, it, it reminds me of um, the, the, the way that um, problem solving in, from LLMs has been developing is, you know, it, it's, to me, it reminds me of convergent evolution, um, which is this idea in biology that, you know, that multiple species that are not related to each other can solve the same problems, but do it in different ways. Right. So like, this we is now everything's going to be a crab eventually, right? Everything, it turns out, evolves in the direction of being a crab for some reason. Yeah, well, I, I, but I mean, in the sense of like flight, for instance. So, like, okay. we've had, uh, we, we've, had uh, we've had like, uh, you know, pterosaurs, the dinosaurs were, had figured out how to fly. They were reptiles. And we have birds, and obviously they're related, but, you know, insects, various insects, you know, I mean, all the, there's uh, so many different insects that are, you know, only very slightly related to each other that all have figured out flight in different ways. And then, um, and now, and then of course there's, uh, they're not quite flying, but flying fish, uh, you know, are able to, to propel themselves through the air through. Um, so, so, and, and, and this is true with regard to eyesight, um, you know, how, how can you develop organs, uh, species develop organs to sense, to sense light uh, and, to, and to perceive things. It, it, there, there are many different ways that these, these problems can be solved and to say that, you know, LLMs are just trash because, well, it's not something that I personally have been working on. It's, it's, it's almost like, you know, a fish uh, saying that uh, the, 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 the eyesight uh, that, you know, some uh, single-celled organism is not, doesn't work. Uh, hmm. In fact, it does work, um, it, you know, that it can sense light. Um, and whether you, uh, you know, think that's the proper way of doing it or not, it really doesn't matter because it's doing it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think AI critics are basically right about everything. Like they, they will point out flaws and they're correct about those flaws and the risks and so forth. The only thing they're wrong about is this stuff is useless because it's definitely not. It's useful for uh, all sorts of things right now. And we keep on finding new things that it can do. If there was no more development on AI at all, if, if we stopped everything and just stuck with, what, with the chat GPT that we have today, we would still be finding new things it could do for the next few years. Like the, 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 the state of the art would continue to increase even if the models all stayed the same because there's so much that they're capable of that we haven't understood yet. 
I, I think that's true. And so to that end, though, uh, I mean, are there any uh, websites out there that you would recommend to people um, if they want, were interested in learning more of how to harness AI for their for their own personal ends? Not ready for this. Um, I mean, the main thing, like websites pop up every day that claim to help you with AI. To be honest, at a rate that's too far to even evaluate them, figure out which ones are good and which ones are snake oil. The thing that matters is actually interacting with these systems. Like you should be playing with Google Bard and ChatGPT and Microsoft Bing and trying things out with a very skeptical approach. Like always assume that anything that it does, it could be making things up. It could be tricking you into thinking that it's capable of something that it's not. But that's where you, you have to learn to experiment. You have to try different things, give it a URL and then give it a broken URL and see, see how it differs between them. Because that really is the most reliable way to, 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 to get stuff done here, to, to sort of build that crucial mental model of what these things can do and what they can't. And it's, it's full of pitfalls. It's so easy to, to fall into traps. So you do need to read around this stuff and find communities of people who are experimenting it with, with you and, and so on. Unfortunately, I don't think there's an easy answer to the question yet of how to learn to use these effectively, partly because ChatGPT isn't even four months old yet. It's four month birthday is on the 30th of, of, Mar of, uh, of March. All of this stuff is so new. We're all figuring it out together. The key thing is because it's all so new, we, you need to, you need to Hang out with other people. You need to get involved with communities who are figuring this out. Share what you learn. See what other people learn, and basically try and help help society as a whole come to terms with what these things even are and, and what we can do with them. Yeah. Well, and one interesting approach that um, uh, that the Mid Journey Image Generator has done, uh, which it, it annoyed me at first that they force you to use Discord in order to generate images, because uh, you know I was like I don't want to have to use Discord. I don't, even, I don't want to download that app. I um, don't want to use the website. I've got two-factor authentication on my account. This is a real hassle. Ugh, I'm not going to do it. So, But it, eventually, I, I, I knuckled under and did it anyway. And then I realized why they did it this way, because um, the way that it works is you can, you know, you, you have to type it into a, a chat room with other humans, and then you see what they're coming up with um, as they are using it. Right. And, and you can get ideas from them just simply looking at what they do, even if you never type anything. That mid-journey thing is such an important lesson because there are a bunch of image generators out there. OpenAI one have, have one called DALI. There's mid-journey, there's stable diffusion. Mid-journey is head and shoulders above the rest in terms of what, what it can do. And I think that's because of Discord. I think that's because they put everyone in these public chat rooms and the rate at which people learned how to use Midjourney was phenomenal because everyone's seeing what everyone else is trying out. And so the, 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 I said earlier that the key thing is we don't know what they do. We need to learn what their capabilities are. The best way to learn their capabilities is to put half a million people in Discord room together and, and let them learn from each other. And that that works you know mid journey is incredibly like is, is incredibly successful as a business and as a community and it's because people had to learn how to use it together so that's i think one of my, my sort of big personal ethical concerns is you should share your prompts like there are websites where you can sell prompts to people no no no, no don't do that share your prompts with other people you get them to share the prompts back we're all in this together and sharing the prompts that work for you and the prompts that don't is the fastest way that you can learn and the fastest way that you can help other people learn as well yeah yeah i think that's good and maybe to summarize it it would be the best way for society to figure out how ai can it, it can help us is for uh, individuals to figure out how it can help them and right. share what they've learned exactly um, yeah yeah. All right. So last question here uh, of the conversation um, is the idea of open source. Um, so open source software, for those not familiar, is the idea of publishing your code to the public and, and your data um, such that it could be built on uh, by other people not affiliated with you. And the, the premise behind it is that knowledge uh, can be compounded uh, when you do it that way and don't keep it to yourself. And, and there's other uh, arguments for it that we don't need to get into here, but for the purposes of, of uh, artificial intelligence, there is debate now um, as to whether or not, um, you know, data, data training sets and, and code for AI programs should be published to the public. 
because you know there are people out there. So, for instance, 4chan has been saying they're going to develop their own, uh, basically, seemingly, you know, uh, Nazi-fied <laughs> um, <laughs> yep. AI, um, and because they, they they're they're angry that Chat GPT won't write them Hitler uh, novels or or things like that. Um, so, I mean, let, let, let's talk about that a little bit. You know, what's, what do you think about uh, the state of open source and, and uh, AI? So this is a fascinating area because um, people who work on AI tend to, they tend to have very altruistic purposes initially. They're like, we're going to build this new thing that will help solve all of society's problems. And um, so for the first sort of, for the last sort of 10 years, most AI research has been very public in as much as they publish papers, um, they publish source code. They tended not to publish the models themselves because of their, the, the fears of what people could do with them. So OpenAI initially it was only available to researchers. They start, the chat GPT just four months ago was the point at which they really started encouraging members of the public to interact with these things where they'd already had a lot of time to tune it and try and denazify it and so forth. Um, but the flip side of this is, if this technology is so transformational, the idea that just a few companies like Microsoft and Google and OpenAI control all of it is terrifying. You know, um, like, should I have to use cloud services if I want to ask personal questions about my health? I'm not comfortable doing that. You know, I don't, I, there, there, are, there are companies that are banning ChatGPT because they don't want people copying and pasting the company's internal secrets into a text box on a website somewhere. So there's clearly... A, a very strong ethical argument for people should be able to run this stuff themselves. Um, the flip side is that until very recently, you needed about a $20,000 supercomputer to even run one of these models because they're, they're very resource intensive. You need um, like these A100 NVIDIA cards that cost $8,000 each. You need a whole rack of those to run something like GPT-3. So I thought, you know, even if they would release the models, what am I going to do with it? I can't afford a computer that can run that. And then, well, three weeks ago, I think, um, Facebook Research released a new paper with an accompanying model called um, Llama, which was a model that was small enough that you could run it on consumer hardware, but it still had most of the capabilities of ChatGPT. I thought that was impossible. I thought, to get ChatGPT, you need one of these $20,000 supercomputers. I was entirely wrong. And then Facebook made the model available to researchers. Somebody leaked it on BitTorrent, and now everyone can get hold of this model, which is like a 250 gigabyte file. So it's not a small download. But then the open source community kicked in. And within a couple of weeks, people had shrunk it to the point where I can run it on my laptop. Somebody got it running on a Raspberry Pi. This, this, supposedly chat GPT capable model very slowly, but on a computer that costs like $40. And um, that's one of the big arguments for open source is that once you've got every nerd in the world playing with stuff, some of these problems like running on a Raspberry Pi just start getting solved really, really quickly. Um, Stanford then did a project where they took Facebook's Alpaca and they turned it into something called Llama, which was tuned for instruction. So it had that, um, that human uh, re reinforcement training. And now it really does behave like ChatGPT and it runs on a laptop. A friend of mine ran it on his laptop in a flight and used it to help him solve some physics, like um, questions he had about physics the other day, just like you would with ChatGPT. I'm stunned. I was absolutely blown away that this technology is now capable of running on a laptop. I thought it would take another few years at least before laptops were powerful enough to run anything like this. Um, it runs on a, Google, a Pixel 5 phone, which is like a two-year-old Android phone, can now run one of these smaller models. And so really this means the open source thing is happening. And um, it's also, you can't put it back in the bottle. Once this files out on BitTorrent, it's on like a million computers now. It's, it's not going away. So we have to face the fact that, yeah, 4chan, if they want to train their Nazi AI, the, 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 the raw materials for them to do that are now available to them. Like that, 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 that's a thing that is going to happen. Um, but the flip side is the, that we, we can now start saying, okay, what does the world look like? What, what is it like to live in a world where I can run chat GPT on my own devices, independent from the internet, I can teach it new things, I can use it as a trusted personal assistant, I'm not leaking my data out to these big companies. That's fascinating. So yeah, it's what, one of the things I'm tracking closely at the moment is, is the implications of this. What, what happens when suddenly these models are in the, in the, in the hands of the public? Yeah. yeah. Well, and, uh, it, it, and, there, and there are some, some more negative implications as well. I mean, so like, oh, for instance, the, the, the stable diffusion 
uh, image generator has now been repeatedly used to generate uh, porno pornographic images of people without their consent. Right. Um, so, I, you know, there, there are implications for that. And, and um, I think you're right that, you know, the, these things are not going to be uninvented. The source is not going to be deleted. Um, but it, it is still nonetheless something to think about, especially with regard to future improvements to um, to these um, en engines or, or di you know, completely different ones. Um, you know, chat GPT-9, should that be... <laughs> available to the public, you know, who knows? Um, and, 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 and ultimately, I think, you know, th this is an area where the the public needs to be having these, these discussions need to be had in public and politicians have to be involved in this stuff because just simply allowing a handful of, of, of companies or universities to decide for us how these things should, you know, what guardrails should be on them, what whether they should be open sourced or not, like, these are not things that are that rightfully belong to the private sector. I think. Exactly. No, I completely agree. Uh, I, um, just in the past week, I've seen two new demos of text to video things. So like Stable Diffusion, except it produces a video. And they're currently a bit shonky looking, but give it a year and we'll be you will be able to type in a scene where so where some politician is is smoking cocaine wherever, and it will produce a realistic looking video. And um, again, we need antibodies in society. Um, there's this great thing. There's a there's a TikTok account which publishes videos of Barack Obama and Donald Trump playing Minecraft together using um, like fa deep fake audio, and it's amazing. I mean, it's really realistic. The, the voices sound exactly right, except they're talking about Minecraft, and I love that because. Anyone who's seen that video now understands that audio can be faked. And that's that's the sort of first step, right? We need society to at least understand that images and videos and audio can be can be deep faked now. I mean, the flip side is that, of course, when a video comes out of a politician doing something bad, the politician can now say, oh, it's a fake video. And I mean, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. So so there are, there are flip sides to that as well. But yeah, the idea that um, society needs to understand what this stuff is capable of so that it doesn't get hoodwinked, I think is really important. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, this has been a, a great conversation, Simon. I appreciate appreciate you being here. Uh, let me put up on the screen your your Twitter Twitter handle. So I encourage everybody to follow you. Um, you are at Simon W. Uh, that's S I M O N W for those who are listening. Uh, it's been been a great conversation. Yeah, this has been really fun. Thanks for having me. All right. So that is the program for today. I appreciate everybody for being here and listening or watching or reading if you are a transcript person. Um, thanks for that. And of course, you are a member. Uh, so, and, and of course, you are a subscriber to Flux and Theory of Change. So you are able to get the entire discussion here. Um, so I thank you for that. And uh, we've got a lot more episodes and they're coming out every Saturday uh, now. And uh, thanks to the support we're getting, we're able to get production into regular uh, releases. So I really do appreciate everybody who is a subscriber. Thanks very much. So I'll see you next time.